Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Neighborhood Science Special Program. We're so happy you're here to join with us through Facebook or YouTube. Now, today, you're going to be learning about what neighborhood science is all about. It's a science that we can do together. I'm Vivian Bird from the Exploration and Creativity Department of Los Angeles Public Library. I am a librarian and also the lead coordinator for our system-wide neighborhood science and STEAM programs. I'm also your host today. Today, our speaker is going to share with us the importance of neighborhood science movement and how her involvement has changed her perspective of science. She is also going to tell us how we can all participate and do neighborhood science. Now, in case of you wonder, neighborhood science at Los Angeles Public Library is about empowering everyone of all backgrounds to learn about and contribute to science and, sustain and, and sustainable practices in and for our neighborhoods no matter how old or how young you are. We'll have our Q&A at the end of the presentation today. Now, before we get started, I just have a quick housekeeping notes. Please feel free to post your questions or thoughts that you wanna share with everyone in the comments on Facebook or YouTube. Our behind the scene moderator will send your questions to us and to our presenter today. Now let's dive into today's program. Here with us today is Caroline Nickerson from Size Starter. Caroline earned her Master of Public Policy at American University. At U American University, she was Riley Environmental Policy Scholar, an honor confirmed by Bill Riley, the former director of the Environmental Protection Agency. Caroline manages Science Starter's syndicated blog network, which encompasses the Science Connected, Discover Magazine, and Science Starter platforms. And she also manages Science Starter's Citizen Science Month programs and the NOAA National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Climate Hazard page for museums and science centers. And she does a lot of other things too. She also does a lot of programmatic and outreach efforts. Caroline was also the grant prize winner, uh, prize scholarship winner at the Miss Earth USA Pigeon. Uh, without further ado, let's turn our attention to Caroline. Hello, thank you, Vivian. Oh my gosh, and thank you for that introduction. I love neighborhood science, and I'm so grateful to be here. I'm also, quite frankly, jealous of all the patrons of the Los Angeles Public Library because you all are lucky to have the programs that you have. It's really awesome stuff that you get to be involved with. In other words, you're able to turn your curiosity into real impact. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and present some slides for you just to kind of walk us through um, what this program is, how you can get involved in real science, and how you can make a difference and better understand the world. So that's me. That's me out in the wild uh, uh, doing what I call citizen science. Really quickly, you might hear me call it citizen science. You might hear Vivian call it neighborhood science. Um, we're using different terms, but it's referring to the same thing. It's referring to real science that you can do. Um, I work at a place called SciStarter. Um, our motto at SciStarter is science we can do together. And at SciStarter, we have over 100,000 registered users and millions of additional site visitors from all around the world who discover opportunities to turn their curiosity into impact every single day. That being said, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So I should start off on why SciStarter exists. So millions of people enjoy science and nature. You probably count yourself in this group. Maybe you're really intrigued by birds or butterflies, or maybe you want to know how the brain works and wish you understood it better. Maybe you stand outside sometimes and try to look for constellations, um, even if, you know, your view of the night sky is obscured by light pollution. Um, if you are curious, if you like being outside, if you like understanding things, then you are in good company. There are millions of people just like you who enjoy science and nature. And the good news is thousands of scientists need volunteers. Um, one thing we say at SciStarter is scientists don't have enough eyes, ears, and perspectives to know everything there is to know, to discover everything that needs to be discovered. That's where you come in. You can work in collaboration with these scientists to discover new things, to collect data, to analyze data. And what is data? Data is information. It's pictures and words and um, things that you see, measurements that you take, pictures. Um, all of this helps contribute to our understanding of the world. 
um, for all um, sorts of different research projects, everything from entomology, which is the study of bugs, to water quality, to health and brain research, and everything in between. All of these researchers um, across all these different disciplines, many of them need the help of people just like you, citizen scientists. But sometimes they can't find each other. These people, um, just like you, who are so eager to make a difference, can't find the researchers who need their help. That's where SciStarter comes in. We connect you to the real science that you can do. Um, and before we go on to how SciStarter works, I thought it would be helpful to give a general definition of citizen slash community slash neighborhood science. Um, basically, it is a collaboration. It is a relationship between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. And you participate in citizen science whenever you do anything to move science forward, whether that's taking a picture of a plant in your backyard and sending that to a research project so they better understand the population distribution of that plant, or even if you play a video game to help Alzheimer's researchers um, make annotations on videos of blood vessels to speed up the search to a cure. Everything from taking pictures to playing video games, that can allow you to do real science. Whenever you move science forward, you are doing citizen science. Um, and I know this is kind of an official slide, but I thought it was helpful to put this up there because I'm, I'm really focusing on, you know, the analyzing and collecting data aspects of this, but you can do citizen science all the way from start to finish, from asking a research question to designing a research project, to collecting that data, to analyzing that data, to coming to some sort of conclusion, to disseminating those results. You can do all those steps. You can do real science no matter how old you are, no matter where you are in the world, uh, no matter what level of training you have, you can do citizen science. I I'm just really honing in on um, those already existing projects that have designed protocols, which mean, protocols are basically just instructions. They've designed instructions for you so you can jump right in with collecting data or analyzing data about the world around you. That being said, you can do every single step of the process. Um, I always throw this cartoon in there because I think it's funny. I think you'll be delightfully surprised by the quality of my work on this assignment. I crowdsourced it. Um, I know many of you might be students. Um, some of you might be older folks, lifelong learners, people of all ages. I think this cartoon resonates with all of us because many of us associate science with you know, being in school or failing a test. I know I did. I didn't like science when I was a student. I was really scared of it because I was afraid of failure and I struggled with memorization. But then um, when I was in college and, and after that, I discovered citizen science because I began volunteering and monitoring monarch butterfly populations. And through that, I realized that science isn't something I should be scared of. Science isn't something I have to be afraid of failing at. Science is a way of thinking. It's a means of discovery. It's a way of discovering something new about the world. Um, and it's something that anybody can do. You don't have to be a, a super genius to do science. You just have to be willing to follow the steps and have attention to detail. And anyone can be a citizen scientist and you can do it at any time. I started doing citizen science on my commute. I would pull up the stall catchers project on my phone when I was at the bus stop and I would start um, speeding up Alzheimer's research. I would map spiral galaxies with the spiral graph project from my own computer when I was sitting on my couch. You can do citizen science at any time with any level of training. So crowdsourcing, um, to go back to this cartoon, we're essentially part of the world's biggest homework assignment when we engage in citizen science, when we make a difference with real research. I'm gonna speed through this a little bit because I wanna give Vivian enough time to talk about the really exciting Los Angeles Public Library neighborhood science initiatives that need your help for collective impact. But citizen science is real science and citizen scientists have made a big difference. Because of citizen scientists and various projects, we now know that bird populations have declined by 50%, that birds are breeding earlier, that there are 50 plus types of bacteria that live in your belly button that the first flowering of 19 species of plants has moved nine days earlier over the past decade, that there's a new type of aurora in the night sky, and the citizen scientist named it Steve. We know that there's another Jupiter-sized planet, that invasive mosquito species have arrived in Germany, and citizen science makes a big difference. I included this stat at the very end 
because of one weekend in 2019, citizen scientists accomplished 2,566 research hours, or 3.5 months of lab equivalent research time for an Alzheimer's research project. That's the Stall Catchers Project. And the reason why I include this stat is the Los Angeles Public Library actually did more of this research than any other team. So you all came in first with, and when we had our friendly competition to see who could accomplish the most research. So LAPL already has an amazing record in moving science forward. And that's the neighborhood science program. You can get started in your community. There are events, projects, and kits. And many of these opportunities are featured on SciStarter for anyone in the world, but there are a number of calls to action with the neighborhood science and LAPL program that are specific to your community. Vivian will touch on those, but I wanted to give you a quick taste of some of the global opportunities. So on SciStarter, there are over 3,000 project events, projects, events, and tools that um, folks have added to SciStarter for you to discover. Some of these projects, events, and tools are hyper-local. You know, it may be relevant to one particular stream in one particular county in the United States. But some of these are global. You can do stall catchers and speed up Alzheimer's research from anywhere in the world. So SciStarter, if you start doing those uh, Los Angeles Public Library neighborhood science featured projects and, you know, you're, you're speeding along, you're doing a bunch and you really have the bug and you want to do even more citizen science, you can discover that on SciStarter too. Um, the heart of our website is the Project Finder. Uh, it's where you can search for different things. So I know a number of you watching might be students. You could search for projects that are particularly a good fit for your age level. It doesn't mean that they're exclusive to your age level. I'll give an example. The Great Sunflower Project. That's a project that allows you to study pollinators by counting the number of pollinators like bees or butterflies that visit a given plant that you've chosen to observe. Anybody of any age can do this project, but the only skill you have to have to do this project is you have to be able to count. Um, and that's a skill that you learn in elementary school. So that's why we tagged that project as being a good fit for elementary school. So that's what those categories mean. Um, many projects on SciStarter are SciStarter affiliate projects, though not all. Basically, what that means is you're using that project finder and you think, you know, you can keep track of any project you join in your SciStarter dashboard once you have a SciStarter account. But maybe you also want to keep track of the number and frequency of your contributions. For affiliate projects, you can do that if you follow all the steps to set it up. For the iNaturalist project, for example, that's a project where you can take pictures of living things around you to contribute to a global record of biodiversity. For the iNaturalist project, um, you have to input your iNaturalist username and your SciStarter dashboard, and then the number and frequency of your contributions will track. Every affiliate project kind of has a different setup for that, so just make sure you follow the instructions on the SciStarter project profile. I also wanted to flag this special page on SciStarter for you um, because many of you are at different grade levels. These are some of our favorite picks from the SciStarter team for the various grade levels for you to do real science about topics that you care about. And on SciStarter.org forward slash education, there's also an area on the left hand side where you can make a SciStarter account. So that's a great place to get set up as well. Uh, another initiative I wanted to flag, if you're really interested in citizen science data, is Earth School. Um, there are a number of different quests from Earth, for Earth School. You know, it's set up by the United Nations Environmental Program um, and TED Education. But SciStarter was part of the Citizen Science Quest for Earth School. And if you go to SciStarter.org forward slash Earth School and you scroll down to the bottom, you can explore citizen science data that other volunteers have added if you're interested in better understanding the world. And some pollinators like bees and butterflies from iNaturalist are even showcased here. Another quick opportunity I wanted to highlight before I got into inspiring project examples and then I'm passing the mic back to Vivian is our Girl Scouts journey. I know we have some folks who are on the younger side watching. If you happen to be a Girl Scout or if you happen to be leading a troop of Girl Scouts, there's a Think Like a Citizen Scientist badge that you can earn and a Take Action project um, that's run by the Girl Scouts in association with SciStarter. So definitely explore that. Okay. Now we have um, some citizen science projects like Globe at Night. This is a project that's part of um, Los Angeles Public Library's Neighborhood Science Program as well, but you can do it from anywhere in the world. Basically, this project asks you to monitor light pollution by observing the night sky. So you simply look up, you see what stars that you're able to see, you report that, and then the Globe at Night researchers are able to understand how good your view of the sky is. This is really important. 
because um, light pollution can impact our circadian rhythm, so our sleep, our health. It can also impact animal migration. So it's a super important problem to understand, and the Globe at Night project is a way for you to get involved in that understanding. Another featured project in Los Angeles Public Library's Neighborhood Science Program is Globe Observer. With this project, you can help NASA ground truth satellite data across different protocols, um, clouds, trees, the mosquito habitat mapper, the land cover protocol. If you download that Globe Observer app, um, and there are also accompanying kits with the Los Angeles Public Library Neighborhood Science Program, then you're able to help NASA understand so many different issues just by taking pictures and making observations of what you see around you in your own community. I already mentioned the Great Sunflower Project. It's so simple. You pick a plant, you count the number of pollinators that visit that flower, and then you're able to report that back to the researchers so they can understand if pollinator populations are doing well in your area or if they need some help. And I talked about stall catchers. You play that game, and just by making annotations by playing the game, you're able to accelerate Alzheimer's research. Um, I See Change is another one of my favorite projects, and it's also part of the Neighborhood Science Program. You're able, just by saying what you see in your community, if it's uncommonly hot, if it's been raining way more than usual, um, if you um, are observing smoke more often than you usually do, report those environmental changes to I See Change, and that helps them understand the real life impacts of climate change. And because of the I See Change project, enough people actually posted observations of trees in urban areas in California that um, the I See Change program was able to um, put together a robust research report about the future of urban trees in California. So if enough of you make observations, then you can really understand the world. And Debris Tracker, another one of my favorite projects, just by taking pictures of plastic pollution you see and recording the litter you see, you're able to help researchers understand patterns in plastic pollution, how it gets from um, landlocked areas to the coast. And I wanted to talk about iNaturalist, and I'm almost at the end because I know that you all are doing some really cool things with bio blitzes and biodiversity by iNaturalist. And you may be wondering, why is a picture of a weasel on a toilet on my screen? That's because this was an observation made to iNaturalist. When you participate in the iNaturalist project through the app or the website, you can upload pictures and observations of the living things you see, be they plants or animals um, in your community to contribute to a global record of biodiversity. And you're not supposed to contribute your pets or the flowers you're growing in your garden. You're supposed to contribute wild things like um, weeds growing up from the sidewalk or perhaps squirrels. Or if a weasel happens to make it into your house, you can take a picture of that and contribute that to the iNaturalist project because that's not a cultivated organism. But this weasel was special. This is a rare type of Colombian weasel that was previously thought to be extinct and had never been photographed alive. And believe it or not, it was on somebody's toilet in the middle of the night. They took a picture, they sent it to iNaturalist, and this observation of a living thing is not only hilarious to me and really fun, but also really important for science. And it doesn't matter how old you are, on iNaturalist in 2020, a high, schooler, a high school student rediscovered a salamander that hadn't been spotted for over 40 years. And this is a, um, in the Washington, D.C. area, and this is the picture of that salamander. So you can discover really important things on iNaturalist while also helping researchers understand the global distribution of different species, which is vitally important for knowing if our environment is healthy, um, if it needs some help, and just um, for environmental monitoring in general and our own curiosity. So in conclusion, you can go to SciStarter.org forward slash education to find some age appropriate projects. You can go to our project finder in general to search projects from all around the world. I really encourage you to get involved in LAPL's Neighborhood Science Program because they have some awesome projects and initiatives lined up for you to make a difference from anywhere in the world, but especially in Los Angeles in your own community. So thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and pass the mic back to my colleague, Vivian. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you for such an informative uh, presentation. And I actually um, wanted to mention that SciStarter has been one of the most important partners for Los Angeles Public Library's Neighborhood Science Initiative. And as you can see from the SciStarter's website, they have so many awesome and fun citizen or new science project that everyone, anyone can join, can participate. And all you need is just a smart device and an internet. 
So I really recommend everyone to sign up for an account. And also you can use by having that account, it helps you to track the contribution that you've made to all these different citizen or neighborhood science projects that you participated. So um, don't wait. Today is the day to go ahead and, and start at uh, sign oh, up for that account. <laughs> really quickly, some projects, definitely internet's important for submitting data to a lot of them. But for some of them, you could take your observations on a data sheet, then go to the library later and send in your observations. Um, and if you don't happen to capture a picture, like let's say of a bird you see, you could still record on iNaturalist the type of bird you saw, even if you don't have images. So um, no matter what you see, there's a way for you to submit that data and help researchers understand the world. That's right. And also iNaturalists actually have the sound recording feature on it. So even if you don't see the actual species, but you heard the sound that it makes, you can actually record that. I've been doing that with a lot of birds that I saw over the weekend when I went out hiking. I, I just couldn't find the birds, but you know, I record the sound, I put it on, on iNaturalist and sure enough, within 24 hours, someone from the iNaturalist community went ahead and tell me what that bird is. So I thought that was super cool. So definitely for anyone of you who's curious about what, what kind of species that you encounter while you're hiking, doing a natural walk, just uh, a nature walk in your in your neighborhood or you know, just taking a break, a, a walking break. You know, if you encounter something, that's the perfect, perfect thing to take to do uh, while you're doing that. Okay, so thank you again, Caroline, for this really, really cool presentation. And I also wanted to mention that uh, of all those, the um, projects that she mentioned, I think I've tried every one of them. I got so, so inspired, um, especially like last year when we had this crazy wildfire going on here in, 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 um, in the valleys. I live, you know, it's in the Pasadena area. And what I did is I used IC Change basically to track the smoke the plume that's coming towards my house, and you know the, the the amount of smoke and the ash and all that. I took picture of it, and I've been sharing that on on the um, IC change. So you know, it's if you go back and look at your own account, and you can see what things have happened a certain time of the year because you contribute to it. All right, so I actually have some questions to ask Caroline because I'm so curious, you know, that she's having this really cool job at SciStarter and, and, and she's so involved in, in neighborhood science. So here's my first question for you. So how did you get interested in citizen or neighborhood science? Yeah, I got involved when I was in college. So for those of you who think science isn't for me, I never want to do it. I was one of you at one point, but I started, um, taking observations of monarch butterflies and that opportunity came about because I was hanging out at my university's natural history museum. Um, I didn't realize I was doing citizen science at first, um, but then I realized, oh wow, I'm helping people better understand butterfly populations, this vitally important species for um, ecologically important species. Um, and I really caught the bug there and I started exploring other science opportunities and I ended up blogging at SciStarter, and then from there, they uh, they enjoyed my work, uh, and they brought me on as a program manager, so I was able to help people all around the world get involved in science. Now at SciStarter, I still do um, some editorial work. I still work on blogs sometimes, because I think communication is really important. Uh, but most of what I do is um, programs like this one, engaging people in science at events that are live, um, usually online, but also in person. Um, and bring it to different communities like the Girl Scouts, retirees, and uh, everybody in between. Cool. So how, how did your involvement in citizen science change you? I mean, overall, after all, like, all these years you've been, you've been involved in citizen science, how do you, how do you think it, it has changed you? It definitely has made me more thoughtful. And I think for if you're watching this and you have never heard about neighborhood science before, you've never participated before, um, you don't even think you like science, the argument just for you as a person for participating is it'll teach you to see things differently. So I think of things um, way more thoughtfully now. I think of things in a data-driven way. Um, just in my own life, I try to solve problems by collecting data, analyzing that data, and coming to a co uh, conclusion. Um, and I also noticed things. I was in Miami this past weekend, I'm a Floridian, and I noticed water pooling up on the sidewalk. And I got out my phone, I snapped a picture of it, and I sent that to the IC Change Project um, because they, I know they have a partnership with the city of Miami and um, they're trying to better understand flooding um, in the city of Miami. 
Um, so I was able to send that observation in, and hopefully it's helpful for them in understanding the problem and developing some sort of pattern. And I would have never done that without citizen science. I wouldn't be looking at the world that way so carefully and trying to understand it. So that's my argument for you all to get involved. It'll help you increase your understanding and maybe make you more thoughtful and more observant. I agree. I agree with Caroline 100%. Um, when I got involved in an iNaturalist or start using iNaturalist, that was what's happening to me. Um, I, growing up hating bugs, um, I had this horrifying experience with cockroaches where I, I was originally from Taiwan and I, I always remember I was only like four or five years old. I walk out of, of, of you know, having a nice bath and then this really scary big giant flying cockroach just landed right on my back. So after that, I pretty much was traumatized and I hate all bugs pretty much from that moment. But I naturally really changed me. And now I, 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 I can honestly I said that I have not really pick up a slipper and try to smack any bugs that comes my way. I actually spend a lot of time bending down with my smartphone, start taking photos of them and share on iNaturalist. And there's something I wanted to mention to everyone is I think there's something really magical about knowing the name of the species that comes your way and you take a picture and you identify on iNaturalist, somehow I think it takes away the fear you have towards certain bug just because they don't look very pleasant. And when you read through iNaturalist, you find out, oh, they're not poisonous. They're not, they're actually a good bug to have. You actually become very tolerant and you actually welcome them to be part of your, to be neighbors in your house, sharing your living spaces. So just want to add that to the note. <laughs> now, a special sub observation on iNatural is called Never Home Alone, where you can send in pictures of the bugs, your your six and eight legged roommates, so to speak. Yes. yes, totally. You will find all kinds of interesting stuff. You don't. I mean, I know our bio blitz asking everyone to go outside and you know uh, uh, explore, but truly, if you don't want to be outside because this weekend is going to be super hot, you can just do your own exploration inside your house. Look under the windowsill. Um, the corners of your, your walls, you will find interesting stuff there, creatures. I tr just trust me, I do that almost every weekend now. So, <laughs> so my next question again, um, not again, but for uh, Caroline is, do you have a favorite neighborhood science project? I have to say I see change um, because I think our understanding the environment is really important. Um, I think as a community, it's good for us to have a shared understanding of what's going on. And in a world where you might be seeing more and more wildfires, or you might be seeing more and more flooding in certain areas, um, the impacts of these are hyper local. So on your block, you ha may have more extreme temperatures than your friend's block across the city. Um, and we need to understand the variations there. And I think the IC Change Project is a really important step in that. And it's very empowering too. It shows that your observations, what you see is really important data. You're, you matter. Um, what you see matters. Um, so I think that's my favorite project because I find it really empowering. I also find it fun to scroll through their feed and see what other people are seeing around the world. Um, everybody has a different lived experience and everyone has a story to tell. And I see change empowers people to do that with data, with qualitative data, words and pictures. Yeah, um, I love that too. Um, I actually, before I I stumble upon um, I see change, basically most of the stuff I did in terms of citizen or neighborhood science project, they're pretty much like just photo taking or sound recording. Um, but I see change actually gave you a space that you can write about your experience, uh, whatever that you encounter, be it the weather or things that you saw. So it's it's. I, I really like that that um, project as well. So you know, if you any one of you who's watching this right now, if you want to try besides iNaturalist, that would be another great one to to give it a shot. Now, so you've done some citizen science and you like IC change. Um, so do you have like a most memorable experience or moment you have with a citizen or neighborhood science project? Definitely, and it's not fair to say I see change is my favorite favorite. It's one of my favorites, but I love all the projects equally. Um, but one of my most memorable experiences is with the stall catchers project. Um, with stall catchers, I think back to the catchathons. 
I um, find it so amazing that so many different teams of libraries and community-based organizations and schools and just people everywhere um, come together to um, accelerate Alzheimer's research to make these really important annotations. Um, so I think my most memorable memory is being on one of those webinars and watching all these different teams tuning in from all around the world. And it made my heart happy. Um, mm -hmm. People from every corner of the planet working toward the same goal um, to, to, you know, better understand this disease that impacts all of us or at least someone we love. Yeah, definitely. So now I have a little bit of a technical, well, not quite technical, but something a little bit more um, how do I say it? A little bit more scientific, I guess, a question. Something that I heard all the time. So since you've been involved in citizen science or neighborhood science a lot, I keep on hearing people say neighborhood science or citizen science democratizes science. What does that mean? Well, I think, so when something's being democratized, it means it's being opened up to more people is my interpretation. So I think citizen science really opens up the gates. Um, it shows that anyone can be involved in the scientific process, that you don't have to wear a lab coat to do science, um, that you don't have to um, be a super genius to do science, that you can be anybody from anywhere and you can collect or analyze data and you can be part of these. It's also, you can be part of it on your own terms. So you don't have to come up with your own research project if you don't want to. You can join a really important ongoing research project and make a difference there. You can be part of something bigger than yourself. Um, but I think another way it democratizes science is people, it's not just researchers who add projects to SciStarter. So it's not just people at universities. I've seen communities come up with their own projects start to finish. Um, one example is there is a project on SciStarter now um, that a woman in Hawaii created because she wants to better understand the best soil for milkweed there so she can grow milkweed in her garden and um, foster a monarch butterfly population. Um, so she did the research, she created her own protocol, and now she's having her garden club in Hawaii better understand those soil conditions by following a really rigorous scientific process. Um, so she came up with that whole project um, she, from start to finish and added it to SciStarter. She's not tied to a university formally, but she was able to add it there and hopefully find more participants that way. So I think that's citizen science democratizes science in a lot of different ways. But it does it because it um, makes it so anybody, anywhere can be part of the scientific process. And if you come up with a project, add it to SciStarter, reach some more participants that way, whether your project's hyper-local or global. I know I sent out this event to all the SciStarter users in Los Angeles, and I think there are about 3,000. So even if your project is just studying Los Angeles, add it to SciStarter and try to reach those 3,000 people. Awesome. Yep. So now I have another question. So we have these citizen science project or neighborhood science projects going on. And like you mentioned, a lot of them were um, actually developed or created by the real scientists and researchers. Now, I know this is in a lot of people's mind. It's like, well, you're scientists and researchers. I mean, you, you could do this yourself. Why do you need us who are not scientists to help you? Why are you creating this project and asking us to help you? I think it's because we can accomplish more together. We can be stronger together. And there are new types of projects we can do when communities get involved. Um, so one example is the Crowd the Tap project. Um, if a community wants to understand their pipes, if they want to know what their water pipes are made of, if they're made of plastic, if um, they're made of some other material, if they have lead, um, they can get involved in the Crowd the Tap project and do a simple scratch test, a penny and a magnet, and submit that data to the Crab the Tap inventory um, to help those researchers better understand um, water pipe infrastructure across the United States as a better as a first step towards safe drinking water. And there's another protocol on that project too about water testing, but the first step is that scratch test, and then, you know, anyone can do that. And it wouldn't be feasible for the researchers, you know, they, they could get a representative sample across the country, but they couldn't get a complete catalog without the help of motivated communities. So that's a new research question that can be answered because of public involvement. So I think that's the answer. So I, I mean, people who, you know, get tr some training in science and get a degree and, you know, become a researcher for a living, they'll always be able to do their research, right? But we can do so much more and we can all be part of it and we can all answer the questions we want to answer 
turn our own curiosity into impact when we get involved in these collaborations with professional researchers and get involved in citizen and neighborhood science. I see. Well, since you're talking about that part, I, this is something I learned recently. So NASA actually have a this whole cohorts of, or even a website, I think it's the NASA Citizen Science. And um, what I learned is from one of the projects that I, I got really interested in, it's called NemoNet. And on their website, it tells you because, I mean, without our participation or without our help, which all of us who are not scientists, but we all have the skill to help them to actually classify the coral reefs of this particular project. And um, they use this special like uh, devices or satellite, really high tech to get the images of these um, coral reefs. But they collect a lot of these, I mean, mountains and mountains of data, but they don't have enough manpower to help them, helping them get through the classification. So if we are counting on just NASA scientists and researchers to classify all the coral reef data that they have collected, it will take them 2 million years versus if all of us help, we can accelerate that research so much faster. You know, we can really accelerate that. And also they will be able to find the solution in terms of how to save the coral reefs that we have and how, you know, and learn a lot more on in terms of the impact of the climate change on them. So these are all some of the stuff that we can do and we can contribute in terms of to try to save our planet. So yeah, th these are all the stuff that I learned from, being participating, you know, in these neighborhood science programs. Now I have a question for you because you you work with so many different again, you know, neighborhood science project. How do you think a parent or teacher can use neighborhood science with students or or kids? Yeah, I think it, you can use it for a lot of different things. Um, the education page on SciStarter is a great place to start for parents, guardians, informal educators, formal educators. It's SciStarter.org forward slash education. And there we've sorted projects out by grade level. So I mentioned that um, those projects aren't exclusive to those grade levels. They just have skills that you would, re they require skills that you would learn at a particular grade level, like learning how to count, learning how to conduct analysis, things like that. Um, for some of the more advanced projects, like if you're mapping a spiral galaxy, maybe that would be good for the older kids because they might have a little bit more of the skills to draw the spirals and draw the map. Um, our NemoNet, that project Vivian talked about, we're going to be adding that to the education page. I think I'll probably put it in high school or college because um, these categories aren't perfect, right? These are just our SciStarter editorial recommendations. But I'll probably put it in high school to college because it, it takes a little um, bit of a more, bit more attention to detail um, to uh, help classify those coral reefs than, for example, counting pollinators for the Great Sunflower Project. Um, so you can just do projects with your students, but you can also um, hit major learning outcomes while you're doing those projects. So if you're an educator and you have a unit on the brain, you can use the stall catchers project to, uh, as a sub subject matter project because you're studying the brain and you can have students annotate those videos of brains. It really hammers home in a practical way the subject matter you're talking about in the classroom. Um, and with iNaturalist, for example, Vivian talked about the power of knowing the species um, you can show them those species in a very real way if you have a unit on different species. You can pull up the, let's say you're studying bees that week. You can pull up the iNaturalist investigation for bees and look at bees around the world that people have submitted. That's really powerful. So it can be valuable in terms of subject matter, but it can also be valuable in terms of skills. Maybe you're um, trying to teach um, science writing. Um, you can have students profile a citizen science project and teach them technical writing that way. Um, it also, you know, teaches... Um, more, um, you know, soft skills, and I wouldn't call them soft skills, but skills that are still really important that you may not necessarily see um, laid out all the time, like attention to detail, um, our ability to follow instructions, following those protocols, life skills. It teaches those as well. Um, and if you're doing a unit where you're trying to teach students perhaps how to design an experiment and go through a data collection, you could pick a project that's really heavy on the data collection aspect, like the tracker, where people are collecting data points about plastic pollution, and you could um, use that project to illustrate those points that you're teaching. So citizen science can be valuable in terms of subject matter, um, in terms of teaching different skills, and also in terms of teaching efficacy, like self-efficacy. It's a real confidence builder because students may not see science as something for them when they're just demoralized because they can't memorize the periodic table. But when they realize that they can do science in a meaningful way, no matter what their grades are, 
it really makes a difference in how they see themselves and their place in the world. So that's another reason why I think neighborhood science is important. Very well said. <laughs> Very well said. I was someone who would, you know, someone had told me about citizen science or neighborhood science when I was in high school, because I would probably love science a lot more than how I, how for the last how many years until I got in touch with neighborhood science. <laughs> so, um, I only have two more questions for you. One is, um, how do you think neighborhood science contribute to sustainability? It's just, it's a topic that everybody's talking about. And, you know, I just want to see if people understand that neighborhood science ha actually can have a contribution to sustainability. And if you think so, what would be, what would be it? <laughs> yeah, I think of it as complementary to sustainability. So what does sustainability mean, right? Um, it means that we're not overusing our resources, um, that society is structured in a way that's productive, um, that is um, considerate of the natural world. Um, and there's a whole you know, field of literature about what sustainability means and how we can pursue it. And there are differing and valid opinions about the best way to get to a sustainable society. But citizen science, no matter what school of thought you're in, it can be important for sustainability because the first step to being sustainable and being environmentally friendly is understanding the environment. And citizen science is really valuable in that realm because as we talked about earlier, environmental impacts are hyper-local. Um, even things that are important for sustainability like understanding plas plastic pollution, that varies hyper-locally as well. There may be a hot spot on one side of town where there's a lot of plastic pollution and the other side of town may not have that problem. Um, and you can better understand that patterns through data those patterns through data. Um, so I think citizen science for the environment and for sustainability, it's that important first step of understanding. And once we all have a shared understanding of what's going on, that can empower our decision making about sustainability and environmental issues. So I would say it's complementary to sustainability and it's the first step. It's creating a data driven understanding. Totally agree. <laughs> totally agree. Now, so we're, this is my last question for you. So for our audiences today who have not had a chance to try neighborhood science, what do you want to say to them? Just get started. Um, just um, if you have a smartphone, go ahead and go outside and start taking pictures of different plants and animals you see. If you see a squirrel, if you see a weed growing out of the sidewalk, take a picture of it, identify it, send it to iNaturalist. It's as simple as that to just get started. Or you could just open up stall catchers. You could minimize me right now, minimize me and Vivian, and open up stall catchers on your browser. You can find it on SciStarter and start playing. Um, it's such a simple game, and you'd be accelerating Alzheimer's research within minutes. Um, so I would say just get started. And I saw um, in the chat that someone asked, does volunteering for SciStarter allows any personal contact with professional researchers who can write us recommendation letters for college? Um, Yes, sometimes every project is different and every researcher has varying levels of communication with the volunteers for their project. That being said, I have a ton of webinars and events and ways for you to get started with citizen science and neighborhood science every day. So um, I've written recommendation letters for volunteers before who are super users of SciStarter. I think evidence is really important for that. So if you start doing those SciStarter affiliate projects and you have a record of the number and frequency of your contributions for different projects, I can vouch for you and say that you volunteered, you know, this much and we've quantified it for these different projects. So that, that's one way you can get involved. I know that the local library is a really good resource for that. I bet you that Vivian and her colleagues have um, written uh, letters for their teen volunteers before to recommend them for different colleges. Yes, I, I'm almost certain I'm right on that. So if you get involved with the Neighborhood Science Program and maybe check out those kits from the Los Angeles Public Library or do those projects that LAPL has featured, you could probably get a letter of recommendation that way by becoming a team volunteer. But Vivian can speak more on that. We, we actually have a whole protocol for that. So if you that is something you are interested in doing, make sure you email us and we'll give you the the, uh, the process of how that can be done. Um, that's for sure that we do have, we, we are accepting volunteers um, for doing different things and Neighborhood Science Initiative is, is a very new initiative for us and we would definitely wanna be able to expand this and have more teens or more adult to come and volunteer and hopefully we, you will be able to get recognized. And speaking of recognition, actually, um, I know 
for if you participate in the NASA Citizen Science Project, you your continuous participation can even actually get you featured on the, the peer review journal. So, you know, the, the key is the consistency and the continuation in, in con con contributing to the data and to the observations that you make. So just want to bring that up to you. And again, you know, if you want to try, you've been thinking about to do something and NASA all, is always the name that excites you. Definitely just do a quick Googling, um, put NASA citizen science, and you will see there's a whole bunch of um, NASA citizen science. And also you can you can find them actually on SciStarter that just by putting NASA, it will give you the whole list. <laughs> All right, so thank you, Caroline, so much for sharing with us your personal experience and your insight on citizen or neighborhood science with us today. Now I would like to open up for the Q&A. So let's see what are some of the questions that we got. We got a ton. Um, people are very curious. Um, there, awesome. are, there are a few questions that are more about um, the neighborhood science technicalities. Like, can they check out kits right now? Um, how long can they use the kit? So maybe Vivian, do you want to give them the rundown on how neighborhood science works? Sure. So we do have the neighborhood science kits that um, we call it the do-it-yourself DIY kits that will be available in our the so-called neighborhood science branches. And I believe there's about 18 or 19 of them. And um, currently they're not being circulated. We are working on a protocol to get those ready. Um, we stopped doing that because of the pandemic and um, it will be in the, in the next part of the, the um, rolling opening. And we'll have more information. Just make sure you um, check our website for updates and it will be there for you. Um, checking them out, we have different um, topics. We have um, uh, air quality, we have um, the globe at night, which you can go out and measure the light pollution. Um, so again, you can go to our website, it's lapl.org slash NAISI, N-E-I-S-C-I. You will see all the information we have related to this in, uh, initiative. And also you can find what type of kits that we have um, that will be available for people to check out. I know there is a huge interest in checking out the air quality sensor because uh, we are anticipating another um, wildfire season. This one's probably going to be just as bad as last year if it's not worse. So um, I know air quality is on in everyone's everyone's mind right now. So that we will make sure that it's available. If it's not by mid July, it will be the beginning of August. Awesome. And I, know, <laughs> I know we kind of addressed Raven's question already about volunteering for SciStarter projects, but let's throw it up on the screen and kind of reiterate. Um, but yes, you um, volunteering for citizen science is a really great idea. And if you do a lot with SciStarter, I can definitely vouch for you for your affiliate contributions. Um, that being said, I'd love Vivian could kind of address the process for team volunteers to get involved in neighborhood science at Los Angeles Public Library. So, our, because our um, volunteer, uh, the, the way we accept volunteers is different from branch to branch. So again, you know, for more information on how you can become a volunteer and how your participation in neighborhood science can um, earn you either volunteer credits or or get a, a, a recommendation letter, you can go ahead and send, send me an email and we're gonna have our moderator put my email on the screen so you guys can write that down and you can go ahead and email us and I will make sure I get that information to you. <laughs> And if you're not local to Los Angeles, um, I mean, definitely attend all the LAPL neighborhood science programs, especially the ones that are online, because those are a resource to anybody in the world. But if you're a teen volunteer and let's say, um, let me think of one of the other, I've worked with a library in Riverside, a uh, regional library in Missouri. They have a really robust teen volunteer program too, for example. So I bet your public library in your area has programs for you, um, no matter how old you are to get involved. And if your library doesn't already have a neighborhood or citizen science program, maybe ask your local librarian to start one or your local library staff member. Um, that being said, Los Angeles folks, get in touch with Vivian. Yes. <laughs> and um, speaking of which, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I kind of lost my train of thought because you were talking about the volunteers, but, um, oh, I would really, really, again, highly recommend everyone, um, if you can, if you are 13 and above and you want to prove or to have that track record of your contribution to a neighborhood science project, really creating that 
site starter account is a really great place to start. You they you can earn badges, uh, digital badges that way. But in the meantime, it you have an actual record that you can show it to, whether to when you're applying for college applications for your essays or you know just for even probably for your jobs and things. So you you know that there is an actual proof or evidence that you have actually done there's a record that you know people can go and look for uh, look at and saying you, these are the time that you know it shows your consistency shows the the contribution you have made to various projects that really benefits um not you know it, it could be just benefiting your com communities or even in, in terms of like a, a global it, have, it would have a global impact so um again i i can't stress that enough that really if you have a chance go ahead and check it out the site starter uh, account uh, check out sitestarter.com and make sure you create an account there actually um one thing i thought of and this is good for folks of all ages but especially teens looking to kind of flex their muscles and say you know i have these skills in data collection i'm you know this level of a thoughtful person like i move science forward i'm a great volunteer we have a new training at sitestarter yeah, um, it's SciStarter.org forward slash training. Um, if we could put that up on the screen. So SciStarter, like you're starting the science, SciStarter.org, got the forward slash and then the word training. Um, on that training page, um, if you go through all the steps, you can actually get a badge and you can put that badge on your LinkedIn profile. Um, it's all in the trainings that offered in English and in Spanish. Um, so that badge is a really great asset. If you're a professional in the working world and you want to show your volunteer work or your skill level with data collection and science, or if you're a volunteer who's a student and you're looking for that credibility where you can show that badge and um, have evidence of the fact that you've moved science forward, no matter what age you are, I really recommend going through that training to get started. Well, that's really good to know. So we should we should try to put that note. Um, we'll, we should definitely share that with our our librarians here, so they know that it's something that they could um, invite their the team volunteers or the teens to participate. Now, I we have a question here is asking. So for the data they contributed, are they able to see them? Yeah. Um, so for some projects, the data is mapped and open. Other projects like stall catchers, it's a little bit different because you're analyzing a bunch of videos and then they release the research result in the ag aggregate. It just depends on the project, how you're able to observe the data later on. Um, and, but for iNaturalist, that's one of the most beautiful projects because you can just go through and look at all the pictures from around the world, but you can also see it mapped so you can start observing patterns and do all sorts of different things with data. Uh, but my, my less satisfying answer is it depends on the project, how the data is showcased, and what level you're able to look at. Also, some projects have privacy concerns. Um, for the IC Change project, they don't reveal the exact location of a particular observation, because let's say you're observing flooding in New Orleans, and you uh, take a picture of the fact that your, your house, um, your, your sidewalk flooded. You might get in trouble with your landlord for that if your address got out, because, you know, you would be making his property look bad or her property look bad. Um, so that's why they, they, to protect people's privacy, they only report the city level, but they have in the back end, the location level. So it just depends on the project, what you're able to see in terms of the data. Got it. Thank you. That's a very thorough answer. Thank you so much. I'm learning about that too. All right. So we are at 4.53, so it is time for us to wrap up today's program. So I wanna thank Caroline again so, so much for joining us today and sharing with us so much important information about neighborhood science and answering all these questions from me and from our audiences today. So now we all know the importance of neighborhood science and how it can help monitor and possibly solve some of the environmental challenges that we're facing today. We really hope that this summer, everyone who is watching this program today will join us in becoming a neighborhood scientist in and for your community. And guess what? To start, you can actually start today by just participating in the LA Bio Blitz Challenge. So step one, all you need to do is just download Neighborhood Science uh, Project Call iNaturalist, and then you just, you're on your way to make and share your observations of wild species of plants, animals, and insects that's you found in the city of Los Angeles. And then by doing that, you will be um, helping the, uh, the scientists and researchers collecting data to support our city's effort in conserving species and also protecting their habitats in our neighborhoods. 
So again, that's all, we can all do this. Let's all help to make LA a truly sustainable city. All right, so be sure to check LAPL's online calendar for our next Neighborhood Science Special Program. And that is all we have for today. Thank you again for joining us and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Caroline. This was fun, thank you. Thank you.